Um, there's a few companies here that are egregiously valued. Hope is not a great strategy, but as far as the explorers go, I think if they actually prove out decent deposits, you know, you'll see the valuation reflected in the stock, and that's, I suppose, a good first step. If we see a grinding higher market that goes for multiple years, we'll probably see a hell of a lot of M&A. And Cameco is going to be going to continue to be able to sign these new contracts for future delivery going out uh, further into the future at very, very, very high prices, well above their cost of production. For whatever reason, investors in this sector or maybe speculators in the sector seem to always be waiting for the next big catalyst and looking for kind of a conspiracy at every corner. And that's not necessarily always the case, right? This increase in production out of Kazakhstan that's hypothetical at this point will eventually happen. Most of that production is going to remain east. I think the big story really here is that the available capacity going out towards the end of the decade from every producing company is minimal. Mining is hard and uranium mining is really hard. This story is and will continue to stand out and attract money. All right, Justin, been a, what about a, a month or two since uh, you and I last spoke, um, longer maybe even, uh, but a bunch of things have just been happening, have happened here in the meantime. So uh, this will be a packed conversation, but most topically, obviously, Cameco de Mayo, Cameco's released their, um, uh, you know, um, 2023 operational financial results uh, that happened on Thursday. Many takeaways, a lot of things to discuss here, but ultimately what I saw, I'm just going to sort of sum it up. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but net profit and, and cash from operations uh, more than doubled compared to 2022. Production on an attributable basis, that is, uh, was up 69%. And I'm not making this up, although I would just for the number because it's kind of fun. But um so they, they 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 did miss on production expectations, of course. Here, uh, it was even over a million pounds short to the revised production guidance from um, from the September call from September news release, I believe. And so, um, basically, takeaway from Tim here, he was he was saying that he's still happy with it. He says they'll keep pushing, essentially saying that they'll extend the the life of mine at Cigar Lake to twenty thirty six, I believe. And that at MacArthur River, they're trying to go to that licensed capacity, which is 25 million pounds on a 100% basis. So not on a attributable basis, 100% here. But um, whereas an, on average, on an attributable basis, the whole company, Cameco, so they're planning to get to up to 22.4 million pounds of U308 produced in 2024. Whereas, and here's the interesting part uh, that sort of stood up to me, they're committed up to 34 million pounds for 2024 contract servicing. So essentially... 11 and a half, is that right? Yeah, 11 and a half million pounds short. So yeah, that's basically my very high level summary. What do you make of all this um, production expansion? Is it doable? Will it affect the market? Stuff like that. Um, I honestly think they're, they're in a decent position overall. And uh, I have to correct one thing. The last thing you said uh, about them being 11 point whatever pounds short. So mm -hmm. they, they qualify production from their joint venture Inkai in Kazakhstan, as well as a number of other purchase commitments from other entities um, as essentially production. So while it listed in that table, it, it's listed as, I believe, uh, purchase commitments, if I recall correctly. Mm. And then they have another category that's market purchases with that they're expecting for the year. So the market purchases they're expecting for the year was 2 million pounds. So production from Inkai and other purchase commitments from a few other producers um, actually make up a lot of that quote unquote shortfall. Um, again, <clears throat> the 2 million pound purchasing that they expect from the market this year is assuming they reach 18 million pounds on a hundred percent basis from both cigar and MacArthur and full production and timely deliveries from Inkai. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think that, uh, MacArthur has probably a better chance of hitting 18, uh, this year than cigar. Uh, I think that, over time, they will achieve 25 million from MacArthur River. I think it's going to take multiple years. It's going to take a lot of investment. Um, and it's not an easy endeavor to increase from 18 to 25. Uh, so, but I do believe that they will achieve that. Um, mm. And basically, you know, something I think is worth recognizing is that they've essentially executed on pretty much everything that they said they would be doing. And with with all of the challenges that has come with restarting a mine on care and maintenance, um, they took a big one for the team by putting... Uh, MacArthur River and Karen Maintenance for four years. Had to uh, furlough a lot of employees. There's been supply chain challenges during COVID. Those are 
largely still uh, persisting. They're not necessarily as acute as during COVID, but you know, uh, securing key materials instead of taking a week will take three or four weeks. The price will be higher, and it's not just for Cameco. This is for everybody in the world, really. There's there's just supply chains just aren't what they used to be for whatever reason. And I think that's impacting things a little bit. They didn't really touch on that in the call. Um, the major reason why Cigar missed as much as it did, which, like you mentioned, they had originally forecasted 18 million pounds for 2023. They revised that down in September of last year to 16.3, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. And then they missed that by over a million pounds as well. And the primary reason for that had to do with the upgrades that they're making at McLean Lake Mill and the automations they're implementing. There's been a little bit of hiccups around that. That'll get fixed, and I think that they will produce more out of Cigar this year than last year. Um, I do believe that Phase 1 of Cigar is uh, experiencing declining grades, and I think it's getting more difficult to get to reach that nameplate capacity for this Phase 1 of, of the mine plan. Now, the industry has known about Phase 2 for a very long time. The general understanding is that the grades are a bit lower. There's some other uh, potentially geochemical challenges that don't exist to as much of an extent with phase one. So I think my, my personal take is that they're going to be producing enough that will keep them uh, fully in the game. They're going to be fine, but I don't think they're going to have an easy go of it to get Cigar to 18 this year or potentially any year going forward. I do believe they will, however, get MacArthur to 25. So um, they also increase their inventory numbers quarter over quarter. Uh, I think that they were sitting on something like 10 million pounds of inventory. So they've got a little bit of flex there. So their market purchases are not an absolute guarantee. They're going to be coming into the market. And the purchases that, that they have made over the past year, year and a half in the spot market have been very well-timed. They've been doing it very strategically. <clears throat> of course, I think the market reacted pretty negatively. And I don't know why they did so in such a surprised type of manner in terms of their recognized price probably because the price jumped so quickly. And if you understand the way that long-term contracts work, it's pretty obvious that a company like Cameco that thinks in terms of decades and had to sign a number of contracts at lower prices to stay alive in mm. earlier years, that they're gonna have a delayed, uh, a delayed leverage to a rising price. So when the price goes from 50 to 104 months, a company like Cameco is not really gonna benefit very much from that. In fact, in some cases, it can actually hurt their bottom line because if they have to buy in the market and deliver into contracts at lower prices, that's not that great. But you can see over time, as years go by, their leverage to the upside continues to improve. And they also are a much more complex company now. They're not just a uranium miner or a uranium converter. Their conversion business is doing fantastic, obviously. The prices are through the roof for conversion and UF6, and they're operating Port Hope at basically full capacity. Um, and then they're vertically integrating with Westinghouse, which we don't yet have a lot of granularity on the various elements of that business in terms of looking at cash flows and, and, and profit margins, et cetera. But generally speaking, it looks really positive. I think that there's a lot of growth potential. I think they talked about that in the call, if I recall. And so that's an exciting element of the company. And it's just a different company. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a lot of sort of traditional investors looking at the sector from the outside in saying that the company is expensive based on traditional metrics like uh, like PEs, et cetera. But what they may or may not understand is that this company benefits more than uh, any other company from flows into URNM and URA. And as long as the flows continue, and this has been the case, there's multiple companies, I would argue, that are way more expensive than Cameco in the uranium space that just continue to go higher because the flows are there. Uh, and so it's it's the flows really seem to dictate more than anything the trajectory of the stocks in this space than actual valuation metrics and and uh, larger entities making pointed investments in quote unquote cheap companies that doesn't seem to really be a main driver in this sector. But all in all, I think primarily the market was reacting to Cameco's uh, perceived lack of upside. Uh, leverage to the price of uranium, and which which is one reason why I think it sold off so hard yesterday. But the whole sector sold off because, in my opinion, they heard more supply is coming and just hit the sell button. And I think that's pretty ridiculous, especially when you think about where the this increased production is going. Cameco has a pretty full contract book for the next number of years. They will be delivering into that. These are not pounds that hit the spot market. 
And then their joint venture partner, Rano, is probably the most supply constrained producing company in the world right now. Mm. Nobody pays attention to them because they're a private company or a state owned company. They're not publicly traded. So <clears throat> nobody really digs into their financials very, very thoroughly or, or does a lot of analysis on the company. They've had uh, decreased production in Saskatchewan, decreased production in, in for no production out of Niger for a number of months. They've been scrambling for pounds in Uzbekistan. We just saw that Uzbekistan revised down their guidance. They were hoping to increase uranium production by 100% going out to 2030. They revised that down to 50%. So that's three, four, five million pounds a year in the next five years. That's not going to be there that the market was expecting. They're setting up a joint venture in Mongolia. I'm not saying these are all elements of desperation, but they are impacted on the supply side. They have borrowed pounds they have to pay back in the next few years to multiple entities, including Cameco. Um, so the pounds coming out of Cigar and MacArthur, they're going to Orano, are absolutely not hitting the spot market. So this increased supply is, is going into two very responsible hands delivering into um, long-term contracts. So to sell just because you hear more supply is coming, and that's what they're guiding for, I think is misguided and probably a little bit um, preemptive. But either way, Cameco, in my opinion, they're doing about as good a job as a company could do. Um, it's easy for, for market pundits to sit back and analyze what they're hearing or what they're seeing from the company. These guys are actually doing stuff and pulling ore out of the ground and turning into yellow cake and they're a responsible producer. You have to give them a lot of credit for what they've done over the years, in my opinion. I uh, lots to touch upon there, and I hope we can go through most of it. Um, a very important point about ramping up production, where that's going, and also their ability to do that. Uh, because in a full report, they did have a pie chart on their operating costs by category. And so it, it shows you where potential issues might come from. And so 41% of their cost, um, so well, almost half of their operating cost was labor. And it's not like it's getting any easier to get skilled labor in the Athabasca Basin, specifically in the uranium space. If anything, it's actually getting harder because the western side of the basin is now also sucking in some talent, if you will. So um, not necessarily a question, but that's a point that you've also previously brought up. Yeah, and they've had those challenges as well. They haven't been super detrimental to the company. They're obviously very well established. They're they're one of the main employers um, in that area. So they're they're vital to the to local economies up there. Uh, they employ hundreds of people at these mines. Um, but they have had their struggles in finding key personnel in certain areas. Um, like I said, it hasn't been super detrimental to them, but to your point, it hasn't been getting easier for them or anybody else. There it's not this is not a Cameco a problem. This is a this is a global problem for pretty much any industry that requires skilled labor. It's skilled labor is in is in a shortage. It's going to be an issue for this sector going forward. Yeah, yeah, um, it, totally. Just a, uh, an important point on top of the um, of of the other things that are going to be important points, as you mentioned. But so so while that's true, at the same time, what I've been thinking about reading this report is that they don't seem worried. Like they're not rushing to by any of the juniors who, first of all, some of them close to home there on the eastern side of the basin, they are ran by experienced geologists and some good people work at some of those companies there. Some of them have up, um, machineries and stuff like that, that that could be of use in the exploration process to Cameco's portfolio as well. And and looking at Cameco's exploration expenditures, um, they spent $17.5 million on exploration in 2023, mostly focused on underground uh, infield drilling at MacArthur. Um, in the process of growing it, as you mentioned. And I know that sounds like a lot in, in insulation, if you will, but when you see that they spend almost $250 million on administrative expenses and that they're getting about a slight increase to like about $20 million in exploration expenditures for 2024, while their, by the way, their R&D expenditure, which is, is um, mainly focused on GLE, I assume, is expected to be $37 million this year, then you start to get an idea that that, that exploration is not a top priority at all. And, well, I don't suppose you necessarily have an absolute answer to this because only Cameco does. But what is your, uh, what's your, what's your gut telling you? Why is, why is Cameco still quiet on the M&A front? Well, I would say what the company is telling me is probably a little bit more clear than my gut. Um, I mean, they're telling us that they're going to spend two to $300 million in CapEx to move into Cigar Lake Phase 2. 
So that's obviously their focus is expanding what they consider their tier one assets, um, bringing MacArthur River up to nameplate, 25 million a year on a 100% basis that I think is the maximum for the mill. And then, um, and then expanding cigar and taking that to the next phase. Those clearly are their, are their primary targets for expanding or continuing uh, the the production out of for the company essentially um, they do have probably the best assets in the united states in terms of isr assets those are those they consider tier two because they're they are lower grades and lower production numbers but that is something that they probably can get into production decently quickly again there's challenges with um solid isr teams there aren't that many people that know how to do this so, and, and a lot of those people are already in operations in the companies that are starting to produce in ISR, especially in the United States. So it might be a little bit of a struggle for personnel on that front, but they do have good assets there. They also have Rabbit Lake. They have mentioned that they could bring back online, that they hadn't planned to bring back online at the time that they shut it down. That is possible. And then their exploration, um, like you mentioned um, off the call prior to jumping on here, deep buried in their, in their MDNA, there was notes that they hit very high grade uranium on the LaRoque trend. This is just on the other side of the border from ISO Energy's hurricane deposit. It was very obvious if you look at maps of that deposit that that highly likely continued to the other side of the border. You know, this border is just an arbitrary line drawn on a map. So that deposit continues there and they hit some high grades there. But it is interesting to see that even despite hitting very high grades, I think they mentioned um, a few meter intercept of 60% or higher uh, uranium yep. that they didn't follow that up with larger expenditure. They have, they have money to spend on exploration if they wanted to yet the entire budget for exploration for 2024, I think was 20 million. So clearly they're not following that up with any sort of uh, enthusiasm or, or large capex to really prove that out. And I think that tells you all you need to know is they're not hanging their hopes on developing new exploration projects in the near term, whether that's through m a or through their own exploration. So clearly their focus has been expansion. The Westinghouse uh, uh, joint venture with, um, with Brookfield, that's been a major focus for the company. And then on the uranium production front, they're going, doing what they can to expand their tier one production. And like I said, MacArthur, I think they're going to be able to raise that uh, year over year it's going to take some time it's going to take some money but i think they will get increased production out of macarthur um cigar is going to be a little bit more difficult in my estimation i could be wrong i'm happy to eat my words a year or two down the line if they're producing 18 easily but i think it's going to be difficult for cigar i um i interview a couple of five or six ceos each week some of them uranium ceos and i like asking them what sort of what the strategic future of the company is like where, where do you see the asset that you're sitting on or hoping to define where do you see it fitting? And sometimes, you know, they, well, they're not allowed to directly tell you, oh, I really hope Chemical buys me, but they imply it. And that kind of pisses me off because looking at their land holding in the basin alone, they, they, I believe they're the largest landholder. They, they hold like 650,000 hectares of exploration ground there with some discoveries that are not necessarily being talked about. Uh, since again, as you point, point out, Chemical is obviously focused on, on other things, but those are discoveries that are that are there already and what they consider tier two and are not following up, other companies would build huge marketing campaigns on those assets where they stand alone companies. And like, for example, the Don Lake uh, project that you mentioned where Cameco hit those intercepts of over 60% U308 last year. Those are lands that they that they already own on top of the the other lands Um some of which are among the best plots of, of land in, in the Athabasca Basin, strategically speaking, too, in terms of location, not only in terms of mineral endowment, because we know that the Athabasca Basin is rich. They have lands in Australia, too. They spend some money there, not a lot. They have lands in Kazakhstan, too, through their JVs and so on and so forth. So they're in the balance sheet. They're there. So that's um, that's where this comes from. That's where I, I put out a tweet on it in an effort to look smarter than I am, but that's where all this comes from. I don't think you give yourself enough credit. Uh, you're very sharp, my friend. Um, no, I think, you know, I, hope is not a great strategy, but as far as the explorers go, I think if they actually prove out decent deposits, you know, you'll see the valuation reflected in the stock. And that's, I suppose, a good first step. I think having a lot of land and not proving out a deposit and hoping that somebody takes you out just for that acreage, not a great strategy, but also not unprecedented. We've certainly seen uh, roll-ups in this sector over the course of the history, 
Um, we've seen it even more recently. We've seen UEC uh, go after some assets in Canada um, and the United States. We've seen uh, multiple M&A uh, transactions happen over the past couple of years in uranium. So I think I think the land grab hoping to be taken out is a little bit of a long shot, but it's also not unprecedented. It, it does happen. It can happen. But obviously, I think hitting a decent deposit during the bull market, like we've seen a couple of companies do, is obviously the best way to to you know to to increase valuation on for an explorer's stock itself and increase the likelihood of of uh, finding a suitor. Yeah. But um, that's that's a that's a whole different game. We don't really like to play that game so much. Drill plays, um, looking at companies primarily that have proven out assets and are moving towards production, actually producing cash flow during this run. But it, this you know all of this speculation on on further M and A and rolling up uh, assets really has kind of a lot to do with how long this bull market is going to last and how crazy it gets. You know, if this if this goes um, sizzling hot for 24 months and then pulls back, which I think there's a chance of that happening, but we have such a persistent structural deficit. I'm not as high confident in that happening any longer. Um, but if that does happen, we're probably going to see less of that. If we see a grinding higher market that goes for multiple years, we'll probably see a hell of a lot of m and and uh, some of these theoretical, um, the, these explorers with with deposits, with potential, even before they prove anything out, could actually mm -hmm. get rolled up. Because when things get really crazy, then you start seeing people talk about uh, pounds in the ground. We've got this many pounds in the ground. And I, I know that, you know, even Cameco is already saying that under contract, we have 20% of our in situ resources. Okay, 200 million pounds. Well, you have to space that out over a number of years to really understand how much of that for production they book and how much of those pounds in the ground will ever come out of the ground, which is uh, not a lot uh, from any company. So the pounds in the ground thing is is something that really starts to get a finer a finer emphasis on as bull markets kind of mature, I would say. Yeah. It's um, a hell of a marketing strategy, though, especially if you're marketing on some of the fam fam more famous financial media you're marketing into uh, generalist investors who don't quite understand that concept. I see it with gold, silver, and whatever it gets marketed heavily as in, oh, the end of the world is coming, you want to own gold, and we own a bunch of gold in the ground, therefore you should buy our stock. And like, for, with newcomers, it works very well. I know because that was me two years ago, buying into those stories and losing my money on it. So it's going to work in uranium. Some of these stocks are going to go up. It's just what it, it's kind of what it is. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I mean, I'm not saying it's completely invalid to look at pounds in the ground, because it's in many cases, otherwise difficult to put relative valuations on companies that will never produce anything, but obviously in a bull market are going to catch a bid. So to look at, let's say, enterprise value versus their in situ resource, that's a metric that has been used in past bull markets. And it's at least a way to show valuation relative to each other, even if it's a valuation metric that traditional investing would not necessarily uh, put a lot of uh, yeah. importance into. Yeah, well, and, but but that's challenging because then you get into sort of the conversation of uh, are those pounds coming out profitably, and then you start talking about first of all capex and then opex and all the other things. But in in the end, if if we look at what sort of was the best value last cycle, that was the companies that went from a moose pasture to a cash flowing mine within that cycle. Um, so basically, from an explorer code to a producer, um, irrespective of how big of a producer producer cash flow, but that's almost. It's almost impossible. It almost never happens. So that's also challenging. Yeah, actually, you know, that is true. I mean, I think Paladin performed better than any other stock in the previous mm -hmm. market. They're the only company that got in production in that bull market. Um, but there also were hundreds of companies that went from pennies to dollars uh, just in a land grab. I mean, yeah, I mean, Energy Metals is one of those that's operated by Bill Sheriff that's currently with Encore. They went from a million market cap to selling to 1.3 billion, never produced a pound. Yeah. Um, so yeah. They, they rolled up a bunch of assets and sold out right at the top. And that happens. <laughs> and it's the same thing's going to happen this time around as well. It's it's picking those winners can be more of a challenge, but um, there's certainly a ton of precedent to take to look at a company. Every company except Paladin produced nothing in the previous run. So you obviously still had enormous returns with 
hundreds of companies during that previous bull market. And I think we're in a certain stage of that happening now here. Yeah. There's um, like this could be a podcast in and of itself because that's uh, absolutely true uh, that these companies are going to go up. And uh, sometimes for me, it kind of feels bad knowing that like I don't like the guy who's running it. I don't trust them. I don't like the way they're promoted, but I know this stock is going to go up. Like it, it's almost impossible because they're going to spend a bunch, you know, millions on marketing and whatever. So do I buy it? Do I not buy it? And then, yeah, I mean, it, you're in this eventually, essentially to make money. So, but I, I discussion for another time, no, maybe. Cause no, no, I, go ahead. I, I'll add one more thought to that because I think that's a really interesting point. Um, and what I was thinking of as you were telling me that is that conviction is crucial in a market like this. And so I think it's important that each person invests in a way that they're comfortable investing. Because there's there's certain people that are going to do a forward cash flow analysis on a company that they expect to get into production and say, well, this company is pricing in $125 uranium and here we are at 100. Um, this is too expensive. I don't feel comfortable owning this. Um, and, the, and they probably shouldn't because they're not going to be able to justify holding it um, if it goes up 50 or 100% in the next you know, solid run in the sector. You really have to know what you own and know why you own it and whatever. And that looks like something different for everybody. So I, I think for me, this sector is far less about valuations and far more about the company's positioning, their messaging, what they will be doing over the next few years in this market. And then flows. How are the flows likely to affect this company? Like that, the, all of those elements matter more to me than the than the PE or, or a DCF. Um, even though those are things that we look at, they're not prima facie in terms of of our, our number one important thing to look at. So for what for you, you and the royal you, everybody else watching this, it's important to know what you want to know why you own it and to be comfortable with your reasoning for owning it. That's that's absolutely imperative yeah that that is the the ultimate point i believe because if, if you own something then you know like okay this thing is just never going to produce but the stock is going to go up and that's why I'm, I'm in it next time you see an analysis or a short report or whatever it's not going to bother you because you're like yeah i mean the guys are right who wrote this and it's not going to produce but the stock is going to go up and that's why i'm in it but if you're in it because you believe the ceo who told you oh no we are going to produce and then you find someone who who's telling you they're never going to produce, it might shake your conviction, which is what you're saying here, essentially. 100%. So, yeah, that's a very good point. That's a, yeah, that's something, it's not a sexy topic maybe to talk about in, in interviews, but it's, a, it's an important thing that I, yeah, should be discussed. You're, um, it, it, it obviously also depends what, what part of the cycle you're in and where you're at uh, in terms of what, what does best. And that saying that also reminds me of, um, what Grant Grant Isaac said during this um in 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 this report during the call basically, which was generally he didn't seem stressed or worried to me because he said he didn't you know he didn't sound worried at all about them not operating at full capacity or um you know not uh, being able to immediately restart brownfields or anything like that because he basically said that this is the early days for the contracting cycle. And that their behavior or approach to exploration in general and in in and re restarting and whatnot, I think maybe I'm reading too much into it. You tell me if that's true, but I think that maybe suggests that they really believe that. Um, you know, they believe that this is really the early days of this uh, uranium cycle. But then again, a uranium producer is telling you that there's more upside in uranium, so it's not as unexpected, right? So, I mean, you you believe them as well, but is that am I am I reading too much into it? No, I don't think so. Um... I think it's I think it's actually pretty important to consider the way that uh, the guys from Cameco are actually looking at this quote unquote cycle because you or I or most investors might think of the cycle as the investment cycle like how long is this investment going to last okay maybe there's a persistent supply deficit and a, a very strong and growing demand outlook for nuclear we see a couple times a week now uh, talks about new nuclear being built or life extensions or whatever it might be the demand story is incredible here mm. but will the investment go through its fits and starts its spikes and its pullbacks along the way 100 percent. but a company like cameco so the investors are saying oh cameco realized less than 50 dollars a pound last year and here we are at 100 bucks a pound and then going forward every year 120 dollars a pound in 2029 they're still only realizing the 70 dollars a pound range right the investors are looking in that going 
wow, they signed a bunch of terrible contracts. And it's like, you know what? They did what they had to do to stay alive. And they still have enough upside potential to be a profitable company here. But what they're looking at is their phone ringing off the hook and capacity that they will have in the 2030s that they're signing contracts right now at prices that they uh, probably never dreamt of. So mm -hmm. they're signing contracts now. They did touch on this and they didn't. There was actually an interview with Tim Gitzel later on in the day uh, after the call where he gave a little bit more color than he did on the on the con on, during the conference call, which was basically like, <clears throat> and I don't remember, I apologize for him off the top of my head, but he he dropped a little hint that the ceilings as far as the market reference portions of these contracts that they're looking at now are, I think he said 130 or 140, whatever it was. I mean, the ceilings are getting very, very high. And Cameco is going to be going to continue to be able to sign these new contracts for future delivery going out um, further into the future at very, very, very high prices, well above their cost of production. And so that's what they're meaning when they say full cycle. We're looking at full cycle benefits in this uh, in this uranium bull market. Mm. So while they have more of a lagged response in terms of upside leverage than other companies, especially development companies that are like, oh, we haven't signed any contracts. We're 100% market reference. Well, you have the luxury of doing that. You didn't have hundreds of employees um, uh, trying to keep a mine on care and maintenance for four years that was costing you $10 million a month and had to keep your company afloat. So they did what they needed to do. And I give them a lot of respect for that. But um, yeah, I think they're very, very constructive. And I don't think it's I don't think it's uh, wishful thinking for them to say we're in the early stages. It's pretty clear. They can see it very, very clear. There's no Kazadon problem just coming up right now, which we had in the previous market. In the previous bull market, Kazadon problem was ramping like crazy during the years of the bull market. They went from uh, one or 2,000 tons in the early 2000s all the way to 24,000 tons, in, which is 62 million pounds or whatever in 2016 incredible, incredible ramping. We don't have another story like that right now. And Cameco sees it. So call over call, year over year, we're probably going to see them say that they're going to be restarting their US ISR assets. We're probably going to see them talk about Rabbit Lake. We may or may not see M&A. That's not something I'm necessarily betting on from the company. But they're already telling us that they're going to be willing to spend two to 300 million in CapEx to extend Cigar. Mm -hmm. That should tell you the level of confidence that they have in high prices sticking around. Because it's not only do they have that CapEx, but the OpEx for phase two is going to be more than cigars currently. So they have an extreme high level of confidence in a robust price environment for an extended period of time in order for them to think about, let alone announce that type of decision. And that's something I think that the market is, is overlooking in terms of uh, judging by the market reaction yesterday. Mm. Mm. And and so so while I typically agree with you know be wary and take everything that um, the company will tell you with a grain of salt or just consider it just marketing material for the company and for the sector because it is their job to do that. That's what they say, but also look at what they do, and that's what you're bringing up. Like they they say that we're in the early stage, but they also act as if we're in the early stage with their own money. So they're putting the money where their mouth is, essentially. And I, I know, by the way, I'm pulling a bunch of stuff out of my back door here, this conversation, but you make a good point that there's no Kazadam Prom coming onto the market. What's happening here with Kazadam Prom right now, though, and I maybe want to talk about it more in depth later on in the conversation because I have a few questions more about Camago here, but what's happening with Kazadam Prom right now, it almost feels to me like Kazadam Prom is not only not going to be the Kazadam Prom of this cycle, it might even be the Cigar Lake of this cycle. Meaning when Cigar Lake closed last time during the last cycle, it created that spike in the uranium price. And now because Adam Prom is coming these pounds short. Um, I don't know if I'm making any sense here, but it, it seems like it, 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 and you tell me if that's right or wrong, but it's, it seems like because Adam Prom might actually be accelerating this cycle as opposed to, you know, dampening it. I don't think calling. Because Adam Prom, the cigar lake of of this cycle is that far off, and because the actual cigar lake floods happened as production is expected to come online, so it wasn't a production interruption; it was a delay of expected production, and that's sort of what's happening here. The market is expecting increased production from Kazadaprom, just generally speaking, 
and that's being delayed. And there's multiple reasons for that. Um, I first off would say that for whatever reason, investors in this sector or maybe speculators in the sector seem to always be waiting for the next big catalyst and looking for kind of a conspiracy at every corner. And that's not necessarily always the case, right? Sometimes it happens where you have a big acute event or there's something nefarious going on. But most of the time, the answer really is basically that things are complicated and mining is hard. I mean, that's really, if you want to just talk about the supply interruptions that we're seeing, whether it's Cameco, whether it's Uzbekistan, whether it's Niger, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, Kazatomprom or any of their joint ventures, mining is hard and uranium mining is really hard mm -hmm. and it takes time and it takes money to get things going. So Kazatomprom, now that we've seen a big jump in prices, I think as a 75% state owned entity, they have to say that they're increasing their production, right? They have to, they have to say to their primary shareholders, which is the sovereign wealth fund of Kazakhstan, we're going back to 100% of substole use agreements. That's what we're doing. And then they're going to put in the effort to do it. Okay, so what have we seen so far? So far, what we've seen is we haven't seen a big jump in their in their capex spend in terms of well field development. Um, that's going to be the big sign that we're all going to have to look for to expect a delayed increase in production. So I was pretty vocal about this. I'm not the only one, but a lot of people saw this. They revised down their capex for 2023, so it was very clear that 2024 was not going to increase. Yeah. It was it was very A to B easy analysis, and that's exactly what they are telling the market now. They're guiding for an ever so slightly increase in production on 100% basis for 2024. Um, and I actually think that might be a challenge. But they are having problems sourcing sufficient sulfuric acid. There's been a lot of interruptions from shipments from Russia. Um, the production within country is prioritized for agriculture. So basically sulfuric acid, the primary use is in fertilizer. And the country of Kazakhstan, my understanding is Food inflation is a major, major concern in the country, and they are going to prioritize sulfuric acid production in the country for agricultural production. So Kazataprom produces, I think it's 680,000 tons, and they use a little over 2 million tons a year, right? So that's their own production. The rest of it has to be purchased from in-country in production or imported. Mostly uh, that would come from Russia. Russia, for obvious reasons has not been able to deliver as much because of the other priorities that the country currently has right now. Um, also hearing for one example, and these are things that that people just always jump to the conspiracy part of, of uh, you know, hoping for just like a huge miss and, and for things to be totally messed up in the country. This is not the truth. The truth is that a bunch of little things add up to make mining harder than it already is. For example, Russia is prioritizing the use of their rail cars for the war effort. So shipping sulfuric acid from Russia to Kazakhstan has been far more difficult over the last two years. That has impacted them. Okay. Will that end and will that shift in time? Hopefully, for other reasons, hopefully. <clears throat> but in the meantime, they are they don't have sufficient sulfuric acid, or at least didn't last year. We'll have to see how things go this year in order to do two things. One, to continue to maintain production levels on existing wells and existing deposits, they need more acid. Why? Because they haven't spent as much on well field development. Their focus has been on uh, building out these new deposits. That's primarily the Budenovskoy six and seven. Why? Well, that's where you can get into your conspiracy theories, maybe. It's 49% owned by Russia, and I think there's probably some pressure there to get that going. So they're prioritizing this target. It's a very, very large mine, very large deposit. I think it'll produce, if I recall correctly, between 6 and 7 million pounds a year for a lot of years. And um, But it's it's deeper. From my understanding is it's potentially higher in carbonates than some of their other deposits. The, if you recall, Uzbekistan's guidance update earlier this week stated that their deposits are higher in carbonates than they had expected, and it's going to reduce their production. It takes more acid, basically, to put things simpler. So the development of Budenovsko is going to take a lot of acid. The initial development of deposit always takes more acid than the 
than the maintenance of production because you have to initially impregnate that ore body with this lixivia. It takes time, it takes money, it takes a hell of a lot of acid. So it's kind of like this, this sort of trade-off that as, as you're producing an ISR asset, you have to continuously drill out well fields because you're primarily extracting uranium out of the ore body in, in the area that sits between the injection wells and the recovery wells, right? Because that material, that acid is going down the injection well, moving across the ore body and being extracted through the extraction well. So all of these surrounding areas are not really, yes, there's some movement of the groundwater, but it's mostly extracting in that physical location between the injection and recovery wells. You have to keep drilling out that well field ongoing. Well, if you pull back on that at all, you have to use more acid in the existing well fields to maintain that level of production. So what we're seeing essentially, and we don't have the solid numbers yet from the company on their acid usage, uh, their, ton, their ton per ton, their sulfuric acid tons per ton of uranium produced. We haven't seen that actually increase, but we have heard the company state that they expect it to increase. So <clears throat> we'll wait and see those numbers as they come out over the next year or two, historically speaking, roughly around 80 tons per ton sulfuric acid per ton of uranium produced. Um, now they're saying that they are going to need 95 to 100. A lot of that, like I said, has to do with the development of this big new deposit. But if you're not drilling out your well fields as much, you're going to need more acid to, uh, to maintain production in those well fields. Either way, what we believe is that they're going to not see a big jump in sulfuric acid imports sufficient to expand on the timeline that they're saying they are building out more capacity they're building out an 800,000 ton per year sulfuric acid plant which will more than double their existing production of acid that's going to help a lot going to decrease their reliance on imports um, when that's operational that's going to help them increase their production and we expect that they will when is that they're saying that's operational in 2026 that's literally 24 months from them just receiving their permit to build this facility last month. That's a pretty optimistic time frame to build out this facility. The previous facility took them six years. Of course, that wasn't a bear market for the commodity. They have every incentive to get this going as fast as possible. So I think they're going to do what they can. Either way, let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. Sulfuric acid, big jump in 2026. Uh, they, uh, drastically expand Budinovskoy. They can develop a little bit more of their, their other existing assets and their joint venture projects. 2027, we see a jump in production. That I think is best case scenario. And that's on 100% basis. Last thing I'll say about this, unless you have follow-up questions, is that the Budinovskoy is the bulk of their expansion. And this project, I'm, I'm talking like 70% of their expansion is this one uh, deposit. All of the production for the first five years out of that deposit is uh, already committed to Russia. Mm -hmm. So not just the Russia's 49% stake in it, but because Adam promised stake for the first five years is already committed to Russia as well. So mm -hmm. this increase in production out of Kazakhstan that's hypothetical at this point will eventually happen. Most of that production is going to remain East and all of it is going to remain East for the first five years. So it's not really this big savior to the West that I imagine some utilities might be thinking that it will be. Hmm. And um, in CapEx too, right? I mean, they're not spending as much money as they should be if they wanted to develop it on the timeline that, that they had promised, which is also something that a couple of months ago you and I discussed uh, in their reports was, oh, they're just not spending enough money to hit those goals. So there's no way to hit them to begin with. So that's also- yeah. Yeah, and I think in hindsight, it's 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 probably easier to say that they aren't spending that money because they don't have sufficient asset to make use of that well-filled expansion anyways. Yeah. So we're probably going to see both things kind of happen simultaneously. I would actually be surprised if we saw a big jump in CapEx this year without also hearing that sulfuric acid availability has improved. Mm. And, and it's a good point that that all of that production, or a lot of that production, not all of it, but a lot of that production is going east um northeast and i suppose but it's uh, because it was also announced a few days ago uh that the government of uh kazakhstan has resigned um and, and obviously 
you know, we all know about the revolving door at Kazadam Prom itself. Uh, that's been rumored to be due to those changing political winds, if you will, higher up in the government, which the government is a significant shareholder of Kazadam Prom. Um, so I suppose what I'm wondering here is not necessarily does uranium go up with these challenges, because sure it does. Uh, but what happens in the broader picture if these issues, these smaller issues that uh, make up a big problem, what if they keep occurring? Where where will Kazadam Prom source their uranium from what what are their clients going to do and just sort of stuff like that is what what's sort of in my brain well i think that they they can come to the market in small volumes um they have a decent inventory here uh, we're going to hear an updated inventory number on march 15th when their financials come out so i will we'll dig into that a little bit um they have a little bit of a buffer with inventory um if they're not able to increase production substantially for the next three or four years, I think that things are going to get pretty tight for them. Um, I think it's possible that we could see some deliveries impacted, although I think they'll do everything they possibly can to avoid that. Some of that flex could come from China. Um, the Chinese, obviously, are the biggest customers of Kazatomprom specifically. They also have joint ventures with Kazatomprom. But uh, as far as Kazatomprom's on a company basis production, they sell most of their uranium to China. <laughs> so it's possible that, and this is purely hypothetical. I This is not something I'm hearing that's already happening or that I feel highly confident will happen, but it is possible that the company could ask, um, could request of their Chinese customers to delay shipments. I'm sure that if that was granted, they would want something in return, whether that's lower priced deliveries in the future or whatever it might be, I don't know. But I think that is a hypothetical place where they could have some flex. And if they can delay some deliveries to China, that'll probably keep them from having to, um, let's say, miss deliveries to customers outside of China. Of course, I don't know that that's going to happen. A lot has to do with um, exactly when and how the demand hits. But they are being uh, a bit squeezed, I should say. Maybe that's not the choice word, but like every producer has been in the past 12 months to 18 months with utilities flexing out deliveries. So things have tightened for them, just like they have for everybody else. You could actually see that their deliveries um, had, a, had a pretty big jump in this uh, latest update. Hmm. Um, and that has to do primarily with flexing up. So utilities have been flexing up on them. It has tightened things for all these companies. I think the big story really here is that available production from Kazatomprom from their joint ventures, which is Arano, Cameco, <clears throat> Uranium One, uh, a couple of Japanese entities, a couple of Chinese entities. Uh, the available capacity going out towards the end of the decade from every producing company is minimal. And we have a lot of buying still left to do. There's still a lot of uncovered pounds even going out three or four years from now. So um, the pounds that are available are going to see some competition for those pounds. Mm. Um, we expect the term market to heat up this year, not necessarily in terms of overall volume, because I think we are actually in a volume constrained, supply constrained environment. I don't think there's, unless we're talking about going out further into the future, which we are starting to hear that contracts are getting longer. They're going out into the mid to late 2030s now, even for U308. We're hearing they're going out even into the 2040s in some cases for enrichment. <clears throat> so we could still see a very high volume contracting year um, the U.S. utilities bought a very small amount of uranium last year in the term market, primarily because they accelerated as much as they possibly could material from Russia, after, especially after there were whispers of this legislation being introduced, which is we're still waiting to hear a Senate vote on that, that will ban material from, from Russia. But that's kind of a very meandering answer. I don't even remember what your question was. <laughs> I'm sorry. But yeah, supply is constrained in the term market. Capacity is limited to going out at the end of the decade. And there are utilities uncovered for that time period that are going to have to pay up for it. So we expect very high prices this year. We're starting to see some pretty euphoric type price targets being put out there from very respectable entities who historically are relatively conservative in their estimations. One of those would be Tribeca, you know, Guy Keller from Tribeca. Hmm. He was, he called out, I can't remember who it was, some of the price targets by, it was, was it Cantor or Canaccord? I can't remember. There was looking at $120, $130 price uranium for, for the 12 month target. And he was like, that's conservative. I'm looking at, you know, potentially up to 170 for a 12 month target. And we're here at a hundred bucks a pound. Uh, so 
the people that really know what's going on in the physical market here and really can see the constraints and the demand that is still on the table from utilities know that it's going to have an accretive effect on the price. How high it goes, I think, is anybody's guess, but it's definitely, definitely going higher because we're going to see a competition for minimal available pounds. Hmm. When does it get the worst, basically, if, if you account for all these things within your internal estimations in terms of supply and demand? Like, wh when is the most um, demand uncovered? Well, the farther you go, the further you go out in the future is where you'll see the most uncovered demand. You know, so if you go out to the mid twenty thirties, the utilities are mostly not covered. Um, near term, they're mostly covered. There are a few utilities, for example, in the United States, that if material did get cut off from Russia for either the legislation or retaliation, um, they would be in near term trouble. So some some utilities are near term uncovered. There's maybe ten percent of utilities that are uncovered with uranium going out, let's say two to four years. Uh, and it, it starts to drop off from there. You go out four to five years, it drops off pretty significantly. So I would say the time period that is most constrained right now as a combination of available supply and uncovered needs, it's probably the 2027 to 2030 time period, which utilities who are uncovered for that time period, if they haven't stepped up to the plate yet, they will be over the next 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one thing because because well, I was I was talking to I believe Ross McElroy from Fission. He told me that it was, um, it was was it Wayne Haley? It must have oh it could have been Peninsula's uh, Wayne Haley. He told me that the contracts that are being signed today they are for twenty twenty nine. So um, it, it's not like that period that you said towards the um the end of the decade that it, it's uncovered right now because just utilities are not contracting for it. Uh, they are, uh, and and they will be as you said in the next twelve to eight months. So, that's um, that's a point. How do you then, where I wanted to go from there actually was into uh, Cameco and because Adam Prom valuations because you you touched upon Cameco's valuations uh, a little bit at the beginning, but how do you, I mean how how do you look at valuations? Where where do you give? Where where do you give value? Where do you take away value? Like because obviously these things, the, what's happening here with because Adam Prom, that should cost them some points in terms of valuation, and what's happening with Cameco's books also should cost them some points in valuation. But how do you how do you typically look at it in terms of what metrics do you use and what's too much? Well, the irony here, of course, is that production constraints for any given company actually end up increasing the bottom line for that company. And because Adam Prom, based on their operating costs being lower and based on apparently how they structured their contracts a little bit differently, it appears looking at their exposure to higher prices compared to Camago that they have more exposure to the market and less fixed price. Mm. Um, so when they, when they announced that their production is not going to hit its target for this year and probably not next year. Um, and I can say definitely not next year, especially if we're talk still talking about 30 and a half to 31 and a half thousand tons. I think that's a pipe dream. Um, when they announce that, the price goes up and it goes up substantially and they profit enormously. Um, so looking at the two companies, I think uh, just basically looking at at their profit potential going forward, if you were to do a discounted cash flow in either company, you would see that because Adam problem is far, far cheaper. Um, it's a far cheaper company. Of course, it has a different level of geopolitical and jurisdictional risk discount to it, attached to it, um, for reasons that should be obvious at this point. They've got yeah. joint ventures, even very recently with Russia. <clears throat> Most of the uranium is going east. They still have a lot of influence from Russia. And um, it's not out of the question that we could see you know, impacts on the country and potentially on the company going forward due to that relationship. So I think that there is jurisdictional risk attached to the name. Um, but again, a lot of what happens to the stocks of these two companies has to do with flows. Cameco is the largest holding in URA and URNM. It's not held by URNJ, which is really interesting to see, actually see the outperformance on a relative basis start to kind of pick up its head a little bit for the for that ETF that doesn't hold Cameco or Kazadaprom starting to outperform both. Um, but, you know, honestly, like I said, uh, Antonio, we don't pay that much attention to valuations. We look at it, we consider it, but 
we believe that there's other elements that they just affect this market. I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that this market doesn't also really pay attention to those things. Um, it's flows and it's the story and it's the ETF holdings. Uh, those have far more influence on the action of the stocks. I don't want to mention companies by name. I'm sure you and I would probably agree on a few names. Um, there's a few companies here that are egregiously valued. Um, I think some of them are likely to never produce. If they do produce, it'll be minimal. They're telling a good story. They're marketing the story very well. Liquidity matters a lot. So one of these names is uh, one of the, has the best, or if not the best, one of the best liquidity in the space and a egregiously high market cap relative mm -hmm. to what they will ever produce in terms of cash flow. But it's a story. It's a story that people like, the large cap. Okay, when institutions get a whiff of this sector and they become interested in establishing some exposure, here's what they do. They go onto their Bloomberg terminal they look at the top five liquid stocks in the space and they buy a little bit of those five stocks. Hmm. They're not doing a discounted cash flow. They are looking at liquidity and they're buying what's liquid, period. If not the ETFs, which are highly liquid and they own a little bit of everything, but of course they own a much higher percentage of the large cap stocks. Um, one of these stocks is one of the largest holdings or the largest holding in the URNJ. And the flows into the URNJ have been very large over the past year of its inception. I think it's got, what, over 300 million AUM, started with two or three. And a big portion of that went into this particular stock. So you can argue all day long that it's overvalued. There's a few stocks that have remained overvalued for a very, very long period of time in this market, and they're benefiting from, from flows. Um, and so in some cases, kind of unique, unique flows having to do with uh, the exchanges that they're on, but that's, that's a little bit more complex. Um, like I said, it's important to invest for reasons that make sense to you. So there are people that will not touch this sector or touch certain names in the sector because they believe that the stock is overvalued now. With all of that said, finally, now we're starting to see Antonio after this recent run up in the spot price, we're starting to see analyst reports come out for multiple companies with updated price targets for those companies because they're starting to impute $100, $120, $150 uranium, whatever it might be, where they're forecasting the price to go or where the price is now into their, their own modeling of these companies and their own valuation assumptions with these companies and recognizing price targets. So um, give you one example. I think it was uh, Cantor that put out an updated analysis of the sector, imputing these higher prices and updating price targets for a bunch of companies. This is a few days ago. And their 12 month target for Denison Mines is $6. It's $2 here, $2 and a couple of pennies here. 12 month target looking for a triple, okay? And I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but I'm saying we're gonna increasingly see these analyst reports come out imputing these higher prices because up until six months ago, a feasibility study at 45 or 55 or $65 was a very reasonable thing to do. And perhaps it still is, but now we're in a $100 plus environment here. And it's basically baked into the thesis that the prices are going to go higher. And the companies that can actually produce in the next two, three, four years into who knows what price environment, I think they're going to get very, very large re-ratings in the market. And I think we're in the super early stages of that because we've just seen the price make a big jump from the 50s to 100 bucks in about four months. Mm -hmm. that's um yeah that's what that, that's one way to put it it's also people have been saying that cameco is expensive since i've been looking into cameco so basically right. for exactly um yeah. but it, it, it yeah yeah good points i think that about covers what i had in mind about cameco and and because adam prom there's something that's not being talked about a lot but it is there i see them i've seen them in a couple of conferences uh, but the the Uzbek government is is out there. It's opening up more and more for investment. It's geologically well endowed. Uh, they're looking to grow their uranium um, output. Basically, is it? Are you getting something? Are you looking into it? Or do you even care about what's happening in uh, Uzbekistan right now? Yeah, uh, Uzbekistan has has been thought about over the past few years. Essentially, is is like Kazakhstan light. Um, they're ISR producers as well. They have somewhat similar geology. Like I mentioned earlier, 
they just updated the market earlier this week uh, because I think right. it was maybe within the last six months they had they had put out um, a press release essentially saying that they intended to double their production by 2030. I think that I'm pretty sure this was last year. Uh, I'm positive this was last year. And so they're producing right now about 9 million pounds a year of uranium. Um, they do sell into contracts. They do have multiple offtakes with traders. So traders will get, uh, you know, a monthly delivery of material from Uzbekistan. And that typically will be priced at the previous month's close. So a lot of that's a lot of material that comes into the spot market. Not, not all of that 9 million pounds, but some of that on a monthly basis, probably maybe a million pounds, million and a half, um, will come into the spot market. And that's pretty much, that largely is what is being sold in the spot market right now. Inventory holders have not been selling their inventory in the spot market. It's largely been off takes from producers that have been the liquidity in the spot market and it hasn't been much. But um, in my opinion, it's pretty much been assumed that they'll be able to ramp and be able to do it easily. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they are kind of considered Kazakhstan light and everybody's seen what happened in Kazakhstan mm -hmm. in the 2000s into the 2000s and teens. It's like, oh, okay, Uzbekistan's right on their heels. Well, their their announcement earlier this week was that um, they're encountering higher levels of carbonate in their de existing deposits and they're not expecting to be able to reach their previously stated goals, which was the double production, um, which would have been, what, 18, 17, 18 million pounds um, per year around the 2030 time frame. And they revised that down to a 50% increase from here. So that'll be 13 to 15 million pounds per year is what they're looking at towards the end of the decade. So it is increased production. It's something absolutely that should be modeled into supply and demand modeling, which we have. Um, but we've got to revise that down now based on their previous guidance. Right. And that's what I'm looking for all the time. Um, obviously not smart enough to run my own supply and demand things. That's why I follow you. Um, but I'm thinking about unexpected spots in the market where supply might come from. That's why I'm bringing up Uzbekistan. It's also just, I, I saw them in London. I said, where is this? I saw, I saw them twice. Like they get their own booth, talking to people. I don't know what they're talking about because I didn't go up to them and I should have. But anyways, it's I'm thinking about these things. I'm also thinking about um, Japan, for example, right? They've been restarting reactors left and right. And they, they did at least last year a, a bunch of those. And, and generally the outlook for nuclear in the country is, is good. Um, Yet some of the Japanese utilities keep selling down their inventories. As um, Borio, by the way, on Twitter, people should follow him. Great account. He puts out some very good stuff. He reported the um, Hokkaido or something like that uh, utility. So a, a lot of it's uh, nuclear fuel. So it was over $250 million worth of it, if I'm not mistaken. So um, next to Uzbekistan, that's something else that I'm thinking. Is that some, any insights there? I mean, if the market is so tight, why does uh, Japan keep selling while they're on the other end, they're restarting nuclear reactors? Well, I think to say something like that, you basically just assume that Japan is just one big entity and it's not. Um, there's multiple utilities mm -hmm. with multiple different, um, different books that have either expected restarts or perhaps a utility that has shut down a lot of their uh, nuclear capacity over the past decade that still holds pounds on their books that they might have purchased at very, very high prices. Um, so, and some of that material is going to come into the market. Um, from what we've been able to see, it hasn't been an enormous volume and it hasn't really been even more volume than what's been coming into the market from Japan on an annual basis. Uh, so honestly, I think the pounds held by utilities that might sell them to get them off their books as we reach prices that are close to or potentially slightly higher than what they paid uh, in the previous bull market. We're going to see some of those pounds shake out of the market, but we're also going to see, in my opinion, that sort of balance off. And of course, we're talking about term market and spot market. Is it the same market? Sort of. It's just the time frame of delivery, but we'll see pounds sold into the spot market and the demand is mostly going to be in the term market. So we do know that the the Japanese have been buying in the term market and will still do some term some term market buying for the utilities that have operating reactors or expected restarts. Um, the pace of the restarts, honestly, for me, has been slower than expected. Um, so we've seen, I think we saw two reactors restart last year, which was great. Uh, but some of the restarts that we were expecting this year is looking like they're going to be delayed. 
one of the big restarts is the boiling water reactor, which will be their first boiling water restart. So fingers crossed for that one, because hopefully it'll set the stage for more boilers to come online. Mm. Um, still overall on balance, long-term Japan looks like a growth story, but yeah, we're going to see a little bit of material shaking out in the spot market from utilities that purchased very high are still holding those pounds on their books and don't have a reactor to feed that material into that material will come out. The good news is it's not in huge volumes. So it's not a, uh, a market saving amount of, of material that should really impact the market su substantially. If we see a low volume month or two in the spot market and there's some liquidity offered by a Japanese utility, maybe we'll see the price pause, maybe we'll see it pull back $5. That's gonna happen um, as we go higher and higher. It's gonna, we're gonna see fits and starts and some material will shake out as we go higher. Um, we don't yet see any evidence of a large supplier of liquidity and sales volume into the spot market from anybody at these prices. And we don't know where that will come from or could come from as we go higher. We're just going to have to continue to watch the market very closely. Mm. Okay. Well, what else besides, uh, we mentioned Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, this Japan thing. Um, I guess you could bring up, uh, Olympic dam and whatever's happening in Australia. Boss is also, um, making a fair effort there. Uh, but what, what what else could be sort of an unexpected angle of, of, of additional supply that you're maybe not, accounting for in your supply and demand model, but you're sort of keeping an eye on? I think there, there's not much that I expect to be surprised about in the next couple of years, let's say. Um, we do expect that Olympic Dam will probably increase their production. And that primarily has to do with the pricing environment for copper and gold. So mm -hmm. if you expect those to rise over the coming years, which we do, we'll see more uranium coming out of Olympic Dam. So that'll be, you know, a few million pounds extra per year. We'll work our way from what they're producing now, eight or nine million pounds a year. Maybe they'll get up to 12, 13 or something like that in three, four or five year time frame. So that's something. <clears throat> We're going to see more out of the US. We've seen UR Energy, Encore Energy, Energy Fuels, UEC, um, I'll talk about moving towards production or actually producing Encore Energy is actually putting cake in a can, which is great. Um, so that's happening. The gears are turning, Antonio. I'm not saying there's no supply response. What I'm saying is mining is hard and it takes time. Hmm. Um, there was some chatter last week from uh, or about Sabanya Stillwater, which is in South Africa, saying that they have a decent amount of uranium and some tails material and a decent amount of uranium in deposits. Um, just last year, uh, director or the CEO, some higher up at the company stated they wouldn't be producing any uranium anytime soon. But that is something to watch. If they start turning the gears on that still, it's going to be relatively expensive and slow going to process even tails material that have uranium in them, but something to keep an eye on. Um, there's, you know, Uzbekistan, or not Uzbekistan, Irano's efforts in Mongolia, that's still going to take some time. Late decade, I think, is best case scenario for production there. That'll be a few million pounds a year. I think it was something in like four, four or five million pounds a year that they expect to come out of there around 2030. Um, let's see. What am I missing here? That's, I mean, there's always the wild cards if we get into crazy prices. If we get north of $200 a pound and it sticks, we should keep an eye out on Chinese development of seawater extraction again. For that to be in volume and commercially available, I think we're looking at a five to 10 year time frame easily for that. So it doesn't really disrupt the investment th thesis in my opinion. There's there's a hell of a lot of uranium and phosphates, enormous amount of uranium, almost all of that is in Mongolia, but there's also a decent amount in tails material, largely held in the United States and China, also expensive to extract, which is why it hasn't really been done. but. Again, we we get up above two hundred dollars a pound, and it sustains. We'll see a delayed reaction and production coming from some of these areas, because you're going to have every incentive to get it done. Um, it just doesn't happen quickly, and that's what we really have on our side here. And we're seeing prima facie evidence of that right now. The primary producers in the world that are making a lot of money here are having trouble increasing that production, mm. and they have existing mines. And in the case of Kazatomprom and Kazakhstan, they've got all the cash in the world to get it done, but it still takes time. It's not easy. So um, we're going to see supply respond. We will. It's 
just going to take time and it's going to take sustained higher prices. And I think we will see that. There's a big difference between this market and the last market, if I'll add one last anecdote on the subject, is that the last market, especially the last $50 a pound on the spike up and coming back down, was financially driven, primarily. Yes, there were some contracts signed above $100 a pound. Utilities that signed that never lived it down. Um, the, the spot price was largely driven by financials and then largely driven back down by financials. So we saw funds starting to dump the uranium that they held when we spiked up to 134 bucks, partially coinciding with the GFC. The GFC hit, anybody holding pounds that could sell it at a profit did. That we went from like 70 to 134 and back down to 70 in like six months. Mm -hmm. um, the big difference here is that this rising price environment that we're in now is being driven by the market itself. Sure, financial players are buying a little bit here and there, but bought, what, 400,000 pounds last month. It's not nothing, right? But it's not the primary driver of price here. We have producers buying uranium. Producers are buying uranium. They're the ones that are supposed to be selling it. They're mm -hmm. buying it. Yeah. We've got utilities buying, traders buying, and financials are participating as well. They're just not the driver of this. So we have much more reliable, solid, fundamental support of this particular commodity price environment that we're seeing and we're going to continue to see. Of course, that's my opinion. That's based on the work that we've done, but we're clearly not alone in making that statement. Um, we don't see where supply is going to magically, magically come out of the woodwork here on the next probably $100, $150 pound move in the near term. When it sustains for a period of time, we're going to see every incentive for uh, supply to respond. We will see it respond. It's just going to happen incrementally in a very large and growing demand environment. So it looks pretty solid from our from our vantage point here. It also just sounds like most of the, or at least a couple of the last bull cycles were driven by one thing, like a few things, maybe two things. And this is driven by like 15 things happening all at the same time. Maybe not of the same size, like um, what we talked about Cigar League, but still 15, I mean, a lot of different things happening at the same time, maybe dozens of things. And what what you mentioned there, the GFC was also interesting, though, because I know you never go full macro, as one never should, but you can't help but notice that there's little appetite for high-risk assets right now. Um, generally, when it comes down to stocks, you look at any other, um, you, you know, small-cap commodity stock, and they are, most of them are struggling. How do you think about that and how do you how do you manage your buying or or selling of, of some of the positions around what could potentially eventually maybe you know be a crash that brings everything down again we don't honestly spend a lot of time worrying about that um we're, we're much more in the camp of we believe that there's a rotation of money in the works currently i think that there's some evidence to suggest that that's the case um that this story is and will continue to stand out and attract money regardless of the overall broad macro, macro situation. Now, if we see a full-on liquidity crisis crash, everything gets taken down with. Um, and that's not something that you really can predict very well, obviously. I don't know if you remember, Antonio, last year was a damned fever pitch that we are about to crash. I mean, I personally know multiple people who utterly stayed entirely out of this investment um, during 2023 because they were ready for Black Monday Part 2. It didn't come. The opposite happened. And here we are with uranium stocks uh, double what they were, um, you know, 10 or 12 months ago. So it's that that Peter Lynch quote. I, I'm going to butcher it, but basically it's far more money has been lost avoiding crashes than in crashes themselves or something like that. You know what? It's it's uh, it's a paraphrase, but yeah. we don't concern ourselves. Now, if we get really bearish on markets generally, which we're not at the moment, but if there is evidence to, to suggest that we are going to be in a, a sharper or more sustained overall broad macro equities market, it's probably wise to increase cash positions and potentially take out a short position on the market. I personally have done that multiple times over the years. Sometimes it's worked. The last uh, few times it has not. So it's not something that I speculate on heavily. What we have focused on, which has worked for us and what we will likely continue to do is what's going on in the physical uranium market. How do we play it? 
And we're going to keep doing that until it doesn't work anymore. And that's worked so far for us. So I do think that we're kind of in potentially early stages of this story going a little bit more mainstream. And as this works, this investment works, it attracts eyeballs, it attracts attention, it attracts money. I think we're going to continue to see that. And that's basically where our bet is placed at this point. Mm. Well, it definitely is developing and we are coming closer to that media stage because you went on um, Money of Mine, which is a, an Australian mining podcast. Uh, very amusing, by the way. The guys are great. Um, I had a good la a laugh, even even though I only understood like 20% of what was being said. Uh, and that was the thing that you were saying. But so it's um, the media phase is going to come eventually. Um so that, that that's just a point, not necessarily a question. Uh, what about you? So I know you never go full TA, although some folks do. Um, but you you do look at charts. Um, are, are I mean, are the stocks maybe looking? I know you don't concern yourself with the short term either, but are they looking overextended on a RSI or whatever else it might be that you're looking at? Not really. Hmm. Um, I think they were approaching slightly overbought status a few weeks ago, and I think we've seen a pullback since then. Charts look pretty healthy uh, to me right now. A lot of the stocks are pulling back to their, I'm looking at charts right here on my other screen, uh, pulling back to their 50 day, totally normal and healthy in a bullish uptrend. And if you zoom out even more, basically what I'm seeing is a bunch of gigantic cup and handles that have either just broken out or are about to break out. Um, so yeah, I don't really go full TA. Charts obviously tell us where we are and where we've been. They don't do a great job of predicting the future in my uh, experience. But obviously the technical metrics on most of these charts are bullish. We've got all of the moving averages in alignment rising above each other. Um, we've got big fat cup and handles. We've got breakouts on increasing volume in a lot of the stocks. It looks bullish to me. Um, I don't really see any reason to be concerned technically. I also brought up something the other day looking at the commodity itself, which is basically, it's kind of like chopping and, and flagging and I don't really, I don't really technical do much TA on the commodity because buyers of the commodity don't do that either. There's zero utilities that will chart the spot price and say, hey, well, it looks like we've got some negative divergence here. Let's wait to buy our pounds. Like that doesn't happen. Um, they are paying attention to the market actually though. And they are paying attention to money flows and spot. And we'll actually see trading around the spot price based around risk on, risk off in the markets. I think we saw some of that yesterday. Yeah, we saw some pounds uh, shake out into the, spot, uh, into the spot market yesterday and saw the uh, the ask drop, but um, the utilities and the physical traders do pay attention. And when they see risk coming on and the discount to NAV shrink for Sprott, oftentimes we'll see some pressure in the spot market of some preemptive buying expecting that the price is going to move up and they can sell back to Sprott next week or next month, five bucks higher, whatever it might be. So we actually do see the market, the physical market paying attention to the equities markets, which is very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, from a TA perspective, I, I prefer looking at weekly, if not monthly charts, mostly weekly charts and zooming out. And it's pretty clear we're in a general bullish uptrend. Right. What do you what do you look at them for? I mean, is that just to sort of confirm what you're already thinking fundamentally, or do you look at them for direction as to oh, do I buy now or wait two weeks? No, I mean primarily I will look at charts on a weekly basis to gauge where I think we're at in a certain leg to aid um our membership in their own decisions on buying and selling. So, and as far as, as we go, when we're actually taking positions or selling positions, of course, we look at charts and we consider the technical technical analysis in those decisions. Um, but it's primarily just to kind of see where we are. Uh, we don't like to recommend anybody chase ever. So if things are looking really overbought and extended, regardless of how good the fundamentals are, we might say, uh, hang on here, kids. Uh, let's wait for the next pullback to, to top up if you're not fully positioned. But for the most part, we generally stay um, pretty close to fully positioned. We have a small cash position currently, but it's very small. Um, and just kind of try to ride the big trend and mm. not get shaken out by the intraday or intraweek or even intramonth volatility, which is easy to do uh, to get shaken out or to get shaken up by by that. But sure. uh, yeah, buy and hold for the most part with a yeah. small amount of trading. Uh, up until when is also a question that I, I 
feel like I've asked you and every time you've gone on the show, which must have been at least 1700 times, but it, it, I've asked you like, well, when do you sell? And then in the end, it comes down to fundamentals. So uh, not necessarily, you know, looking at, at, at the charts and having an RSI above 70 or something like that, as far as I understand it. Well, I think seeing extended charts, if that's coinciding with um, physical market evidence of of some kind of topping, would be probably the sell point, right? So we're if we're looking at a euphoric market, and we actually start to see the spot price make very very large moves to the upside, and that results in liquidity that comes into the spot market that suggests that the price is not going to continue. I mean, this is why we have the contacts that we have and we have the focus on the physical market. I mean, this is really what it's all about. <laughs> I mentioned over and over, there's no evidence of increased liquidity here. Yeah, the Japanese sold a little bit of pounds last year. Um, and yes, traders with off takes are selling pounds on a consistent basis, but we haven't seen the price really incentivize uh, much more volume to be sold in the spot market. Volumes last year in the spot market were lower than the year before. And generally speaking, the overall vibe right now in the, in the spot market is the price is going to continue to go higher. Why would I sell here? That that's And that's pretty much what everybody is thinking with an exception of either entities wanting to get pounds off their books that they paid a lot more money for uh, a very long time ago, like we mentioned with the Japanese. And that's few. Yeah. There's a few examples of that and, and not a whole lot. Um, or traders with off takes that are selling and they're profiting month over month because the price is going up. Uh, but besides that, there's no evidence that we've seen um, increased liquidity in the spot market, just the opposite. So people are just holding more generally. But yeah, I mean, you're going to want to pay yourself on the way up. You're going to want to exit your posi positions and tranches. You're going to want to be early in your selling um, because when it, if and when we reach a point where it's ultra clear that you should be out of this investment, you're going to be selling at the same time everybody else is, and that's not fun. So uh, we don't suggest doing that. Our plan essentially is to scale out slowly, probably over the course of years. And we're gonna start doing so earlier than you might think. Um, we're not there yet, by the way. We have not scaled out in terms of profit taking in anything yet. Um, we have altered and changed positions, sold out of certain stocks, bought other stocks, et cetera, over the years. But we're not in that profit taking leg yet. Um, but yeah, you're gonna want to, you're going to want to know what's going on in the physical market. That mm. is ultra, ultra important if you have money on the line in this sector. Yeah. Well, that's but what about because you since you started the newsletter, I believe you're up something like 6x. So 100 bucks is now 600 bucks. Have you taken that initial 100 bucks off the table? No. I mean, like I said, we've we've traded out of positions or partially out of positions over the years, um, taking profits. So we had a, we've had a couple of lost trades along the way as well. But mm. overall, our, our focus list portfolio is up uh, almost 500% um in just about five years it'll be five years in august four and a half years right so no we we continue to hold i mean honestly i antonio i think that's the hardest thing in investing is holding on to winners i really do um and of course selling i think selling is hard buying is easy right um selling is hard holding on to winners is very hard we think there's a lot of upsides still left on the table so no we haven't generally taken profits yet hmm. but like, I, I want to ask you why, but it, it sounds silly because you can just tell me what, well, because of what we spoke about over the last one and a half hours or something like that. But just sort of the, the idea behind, that, I feel like I don't, I'm, I, I don't have those kind of returns, but if, if I did, well, I don't know how I would react because I've never had them, but why not take that risk off the table and, and sleep better at night, basically? Because I sleep fine right now in the way that we're positioned, knowing what we know. Mm. Um, and I should, I should... I should say this differently. We haven't taken profits based on a fundamental reason to exit anything. We've taken profits on trades and booked those profits. Sure. We've sold, we've sold out positions at a profit and booked those profits. And that's part of our numbers. So we we're not holding the same positions we held five years ago. Some of them we are, but, uh, but some of them we're not. It's a different portfolio now than it was five years ago. And that's had to do with a number of trades over the years. So no, we're not holding the initial bucket of stocks that we held five years ago and have never sold anything. That's not what I intended to uh, to say. We have done some trading and booked profits on some of those, most of those trades. 
Um, so part of that 500% that we're right around there right now, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but um, part of that is booked profits on trades along the way. But okay. for the most part, we do still hold some positions that we held on day one. Um, and we will continue to hold those for the foreseeable future until and unless something changes for the company. And most of the times that we have exited or repositioned money, it has to do with um, with the company. Um, in fact, every time it's had to do, it hasn't hasn't had to do with fundamental reasons for the sector. Like we, we expect a big pullback in the in the sector. We expect um, more liquidity coming into the spot market. The spot price has dropped. It's been we don't really like to speculate like that. Um, a lot of that has to do with where we're based, which is in the United States. We have to think about tax implications and things like that. Long term, short term capital gains trying to reposition correctly in something we want to be in when we know there's upside pressure for the commodity is way, way more stressful than holding a full book through a volatile market for me. Hmm. Well, that, that also probably answers another question that I had something that I've been wondering about you specifically, because I know that you like sort of the, the bigger market cap companies, the companies that have something proven in the ground or something that you expect or is already working. But there's going to come a time in the market where the um, the smaller caps are just going to start outperforming, supposedly. I mean, or it has happened historically. I don't know if it's exactly going to happen this time or not. But first of all, yeah, do, do you think it's going to happen? And are you going to adjust the portfolio to fit that? Um, I do think it's going to happen. I actually think it's kind of starting to happen now. I mentioned um, we'd like to chart. URNJ against Cameco or URNJ against Kazanoprom, some of the larger cap stocks in the sector, right. or even just URNJ against URA. And you can actually see how that's that chart on a relative basis have kind of done a couple of fits and starts, but it's breaking out right now. Um, and then historically speaking, that's just kind of how things go in resource markets. Usually the smart money positions first, usually the smart money goes after what's liquid. So oftentimes we'll see the larger cap stocks sort of move first and make bigger moves in the first legs of the market. That's exactly what we've seen. Yes, there's been a handful of stocks that were very, very small cap, you know, 2018 to 2020 that have returned multiples relative to the large caps. But generally speaking, the large caps have moved more in the last 18 to 24 months. Hmm. We hmm. expect that to start to rotate. We actually can see evidence that it is starting to rotate. Um, will we adjust our positioning into small caps? Well, I already mentioned, we don't really like to invest in uh, drill plays speculatively. So most of the small caps are explorer stocks. So generally speaking, no, we're pretty comfortable with what we hold right now. Largely that's development companies. So these are not necessarily the large caps. We have more exposure to I would call what I would call mid caps. And we think we are going to see an outperformance of what we hold relative to the large caps for the the possibly for the remainder of the market, definitely in the next few legs. Mm, fair point. You're already giving me more than I could have asked for. So uh, yeah, that's it. I think I'm all out of questions. What am I? Yeah, but you talk to a lot of actually smart people like the Aussie guys. They ask you some great questions. What are people asking you that I'm not asking you? Well, honestly, I mean, I think you ask more intelligent questions than than most interviewers. Uh, so I know you you like to have that self-deprecating humor, but uh, I think you're killing it. And I, I love doing interviews with you because you ask more difficult questions than than most do. So I, I wouldn't say that I'm being asked by other interviewers anything that's necessarily uh, more inquisitive or intelligent than what what you just hit me with. But I think we covered the important stuff. Um, I would I would really just reiterate generally speaking to whoever's watching this to stop looking for conspiracies and major disruptive catalysts all the time. And just, just mining is hard. Things are far more complex than you have any idea. And we're going to see a constrained supply environment, despite the best efforts of the best actors in the sector. Um, so that's, that's my prediction. That's what I'm seeing. And we are, like I said, we're just about fully positioned. We expect this to go considerably higher. Like I mentioned, we're not alone with some of the price targets that are being thrown around by very experienced, very professional money managers. We're looking for a 50 plus percent increase in the spot price this year. Um, but again, we don't really even necessarily focus on what we're expecting this year. This is a bigger trend and we intend to ride that um potentially to the end, depending on when that comes. And, and that will be determined 
by a couple of things. One will be the flow of money into the financials is going to dictate how quickly and how sharply the price goes up. Because if if Sprott actually ends up buying, let's say they're limiting 9 million pounds per year, which is the agreement they made with the Ontario Securities Commission to get that one and a half billion ATM re-upped. If they buy 9 million pounds this year, which I don't think they will, but if they do, we're going to see a huge, huge uh, price response. Are there catalysts potentially coming up? Of course, there always are the potential for catalysts. You know, One of the big ones on the forefront is the potential ban of uranium with the legislation that still has to be voted on by the Senate, whether or not that passes, whether or not Russia actually cuts off deliveries in response to that. Those are potentials that are swimming out there, but these aren't things that we trade around. These aren't things that we need for this thesis to work out. It's really, let it be a boring story is what I'm saying. Let it be a simple demand growth story with insufficient supply. That's what we're looking at. It's actually not that difficult to model out the demand. The supply is a little bit more tricky, but it's still clear enough to see that it's insufficient and it's not going to drastically change for quite a few years until we have a big ramp from Kazatoprom, Arrow producing, Phoenix producing from Denison, DASA producing. I mean, all of these things have to happen to balance this market. And if they don't happen, it's not going to balance for a very, very long time. Um, so we expect sustained high prices and a re-rating on the valuations and price targets for the stocks in the space. That's kind of where we're at right now.